Good morning to everyone here today. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord today on this Easter Sunday. So welcome to our 9 a.m. service. I want to welcome everyone here today, including those of you that want to be here and those of you that are as excited to be here as, as this guy. Um, because every Easter there are, there are family members that, oh, mom wants us to go to church, so, so they kind of get dragged to church on Easter, and I don't really want to be here, but I hope that, uh, that you will be blessed and encouraged by today, and I hope that I don't contribute to you being this guy. Um, there, is, uh, there is actually uh, a meme going around uh, where there's a guy like this in, in church, and, uh, and he tells the pastor at the end of the service, I was praying for you the whole time in, in the service. Uh, so I will do my best not to put you to sleep because what we're talking about today is, is exciting. Uh, what we're talking about today is the best news that we ever heard, and that is that Jesus Christ, our Lord, has overcome the world. Uh, he told the disciples at the Last Supper, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And the empty tomb is the, the sign that Jesus did indeed overcome the world. And so today we celebrate the empty tomb. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now it might surprise you to know that there are a lot of people in our world today that do not believe in Jesus and do not believe in the resurrection. But what might, might uh, truly um, surprise you is our churches are full of people who aren't sure that Jesus really did rise from the dead. There are many people that come to church, some of them on a regular basis, that actually have deep doubts as to whether or not this Christianity stuff is true. You're my primary audience today, if you fit in that category. I want to talk with you for the next few minutes about what Christianity is at its core and if you have doubts about Christianity, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're listening. Because you're actually showing some intellectual honesty and courage by confronting those doubts. Now, I cannot, in the 30-minute message, cover all of the evidence for Christianity. But I hope I can provoke some thought and encourage you to go deeper. And if any of you have questions about anything that I say, please Make an appointment with me. I would love to talk with you more about this. But as we go into uh, this, I, I was thinking about when I was a kid, and I used to have lots of questions. And I would ask uh, questions of my parents. And those of you that are here today, and uh, you have kids, uh, you know how kids love to ask questions. Those of you that are kids, you like to ask questions. And uh, so I remember asking questions like, you know, why is the sky blue? I still don't know if I know the answer to that completely, but, uh, and then, uh, why do I have to go to school, you know? I mean, how many kids here today have that question? Why do I have to go to school? Okay, you know, so yeah, um, <laughs> my wife raised her hand, she's a teacher. Um, so, why do I have to go to school, and then, uh, you, know, uh, you know, why do I have to eat liver? Uh, this was a real question. Uh, my mom, for whatever reason, used to make chicken liver, uh, liver and onions, and I had to eat it. My dad had this rule that whatever mom made, I had to eat without complaint. And, uh, but when liver came, that was kind of hard uh, not to complain. Uh, I still chalk that up to child abuse, personally. But uh, that's, that just, my parents were awesome, but no parents perfect. I had to eat liver. So, but now that I'm 54 years old, I don't have to eat liver anymore. So, um, so we, uh, we kind of approach, though, sometimes church and Christianity like that. There are some things that we don't like. There are some things that we do. And then we're like, well, now that I'm out of the house or whatnot, I don't have to do it anymore. And, uh, and it's not really a good reason because ultimately, when it came to me asking questions of my parents, what I really appreciated was the comforting presence of my parents. The fact that I could go to my parents with these questions and I would get answers. Now, this is in the day and age before Google, before the Internet, before cell phones and all that. So uh, kids here today, that means I, was, I grew up in the dark ages. But uh, I uh, would go to my parents when I had questions. And, and I would say to you parents, never, never uh, push your kids away when they ask questions of you. You want them coming to you. Just as God wants us to come to him with questions. We are all made for relationships. We're made for relationships. And the power of Christianity is the fact that the God of this universe, the God who created you, wants to have a relationship with you. And I want to talk with you about that today. 
If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to look at, at a few verses here in, in this wonderful passage. This is a letter that the Apostle Paul, for those of you that may not be, uh, and you know, I don't want to take it for granted, some of you may be here today and you haven't really been in church, you haven't really grown up in church, and so, so you don't understand, like, what's the Bible and all that? Well, the Bible is a collection of writings, and this particular writing that we're turning to is in the New Testament, and 1 Corinthians was actually a letter that Paul the Apostle wrote to a church that was in Corinth. And so this letter was written in the 5th decade of the 1st century A.D. So it was written in the 50s A.D., probably sometime between 51 and 57. Scholars date it around there. And Paul, in this letter, uh, is addressing some central points about uh, the Christian faith. And so I want to read to you uh, what he says in verse, starting in verse number 12. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 12. If, if you do not have a Bible, there should be one in the seat back pocket. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version, but the version that you have is going to be very similar to this. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen." And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Now, these are strong words from Paul the Apostle, but I want you to understand what he is saying here. Paul is staking everything on the resurrection of Jesus. He is saying that if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then Christianity is not true. That's what he's saying. And if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then your faith in Christ is futile. It's meaningless. He goes on to say, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we should be pitied more than anyone else in the world because we are believing in foolishness. That's what Paul is saying. Paul, however, is saying these words because there were some people in Corinth, in the church at Corinth, that were questioning whether or not the dead are one day going to rise again. They were questioning the idea of the resurrection of the dead. And basically, you can understand this, because I want us to get real here for a second. We've all lost loved ones. We've all lost people that we care about. And so many of the people in the church in Corinth were discouraged by this. They had joined the church, and yet people were still dying. They were still losing loved ones. And they're like, you know, it just seems like people are still born, being born and dying, just like was the case before this Jesus came. So, it, you know, it didn't seem like Jesus made that much of a difference in the grand scheme of things. There's still death. And let's understand that death is the ultimate enemy of mankind. Every one of us has a ticking clock. We are not immortal in this life. Every one of us will die, and we know it. And we look at, at certain celebrities, for example, that we've grown up with, and we see them getting older. And we're like, wow, I'm glad I'm not getting older, right? But in fact, we are. You know, I, I, as a pastor, I look, I got, came here to the church 14 years ago, I look around, kids, kids that I uh, did baby dedications for are now teenagers. And I'm like, how did that happen? You know, and we see how life just continues to go on. And, and it's like, you know, and then people die and we lose loved ones and there's tragedy and there's, there's hardship and there's heartache. And it's like, you know, is this really true? 
That's the kind of doubt that the church in Corinth was having. That's what Paul's referring to. That's what Paul's talking to them about. He's saying, look, there is no reason for you to question that the dead, your loved ones, are with the Lord now and that their bodies will one day rise again and they'll be reunited. There's no question for you to doubt that because Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus conquered death. And because Jesus conquered death, therefore his followers will also conquer death. But if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we are in trouble. Because this life is all there is. I read an article a couple days ago from an atheist. And I write sometimes on a website platform called Medium. And this particular writer is an atheist writer. And she has like tens of thousands of followers. And little old me has like a thousand followers compared to her. So it's like she's got this large platform and she writes all of these articles that are very anti-Christian. Very anti-Christian. In fact, the whole medium platform is dominated by, by you know, people who are not Christians and are very hostile to Christianity. And so I try to be just a little bit of a candle in the dark in that platform. But she... Uh, has amassed all these followers and she's constantly mocking Christianity and writing some of the most offensive articles. If I were to just read off some of the titles to you, it would, I would have to have the kids leave because they're extremely offensive and very, very anti-Christian. And, uh, and so, but in, recently she confessed in one of her articles that she's been given a pretty serious and unfortunate health diagnosis. And she is complaining in the article about her dad, who's a believer in Christ, and her dad's praying for her. And she's basically saying she's pitying her dad for praying for her. And then, then she says, you know, the reality is I've got to make the best of the time I have left because this is all that there is. Now, that's the hope that atheists have. This life is it. This is all we got. Make the most of it. That's what the world offers. Jesus offers something a whole lot better and a whole lot more than that. Jesus is offering you eternal life. Jesus is offering you a relationship right now that you can have a relationship right now with your creator, with God. And have the comforting presence of your heavenly father right now. And when you die, know that you will go into his presence and you will be with him for all eternity. Now that is a pretty good offer. That's hope. But obviously there's some people that don't believe it and they're not sure about it. I want to quickly go through with you right now, very quickly, bad reasons for you to doubt or reject the Bible and Christianity. Because a lot of people reject what I just said. This idea of eternal life and salvation and Jesus and all that. It's like, psh, I'm not believing in that nonsense. I want to tell you some of the reasons that people reject it and why these are bad reasons. Number one, uh, Christians are hypocrites. Now, the, the, I've heard this a lot. And you'll also see this a lot in, in, when I, go, I talk about medium. People write these articles about this scandal, this pastor fell to this scandal, this Christian did this, this Christian did that. And how can we trust in Christians because they do bad stuff? They're hypocrites. And we have, you know, the classic original definition of hypocrisy is pretending to believe in something that you don't. That's what a hypocrite really is. And let's be honest that there are charlatans and pretenders in churches today. That's a, that's a fact. But we have redefined hypocrisy to be inconsistency. So that anyone who says they believe something, and then if they fall short of that, they're a hypocrite. That's how we've kind of redefined hypocrisy in our day and age. By that definition, everybody's a hypocrite. Show me someone who consistently and totally and fully lives up to their stated beliefs all the time. You know, and I love it. That's why Zig Ziglar made the comment when he invited someone to church. And she said, I don't go to church because there's full of hypocrites. And he said, come on down. We got room for one more. So that is not a good reason. Um, or just Christians are insert whatever negative verb or negative adjective or negative noun or whatever. Christians are terrible. 
Christians are hateful, they're bigots, they're blah, 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 all this other stuff they insert. And it's like, well, as if Christians have the monopoly on being messed up. You know, yeah, there's a lot of professing Christians that are messed up, but I know some non-Christians that are messed up too. You know, and so the idea that you can point your finger, do you realize there are over 2 billion people on planet Earth today that identify in some form or fashion with Christianity? When you look at a group of 2 billion people, you're going to find some messed up people in that group. And so the idea that you're going to say, well, Christians are blah, so I'm not going to be a part of Christianity, that is not a good logical reason. Because I'm not asking you to have faith in Christianity, the religion. I'm asking you to have faith in Christ. So don't judge Christians by their conduct so much as judge them by Christ. Judge Christianity by Christ, the founder of Christianity. Or you think the Bible or church are boring. They're just boring and it doesn't really speak to you. Well, there are some things that I find that are boring in life. For example, I think algebra is boring. Anyone agree with me on that? All right, geometry, boring. Chemistry, boring. Okay, biology, boring. All right, but these subjects are important. So there are some things that you might not be interested in because your taste or preferences is in some other area, but it doesn't mean they aren't important. And you have to sometimes study stuff and confront things, even if you find it boring because it's important. And then you might be saying, well, it doesn't really speak to me. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you want God to speak to you? And a lot of people really, they say they want God to speak to them, but in reality, they really don't because they're content to go on. And the reality is that a lot of people, they just have other priorities. And so they dismiss Christianity because other things are more important to them, and they just kind of dismiss it. But I like what C.S. Lewis said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. If true, of infinite importance. The only thing that cannot be is moderately important. So your relationship with God is the most important relationship that you have. And you better make sure that you give it the high importance that it, that it deserves. There's also some people that reject Christianity because of the telephone game. How many of you play the telephone game? All right. And some, some of you are raising your hand. So here's the, here's the idea. Um, if I were to whisper a message over here to Jed, and he were to whisper that message to Gladys, and then it just kind of goes around the auditorium, by the time it comes back around over here to Andrew and to me, that would be a completely different message probably. And that's the telephone game. Now, the reason why that game works is because some people <laughs> intentionally mess up the message because they want to be, be mischievous and funny about it. All right? But, but here's, the, here's how it applies to Christianity. They're like, Christianity, 2,000-year-old religion. How do you guys know that what was done 2,000 years ago is really the truth? It all, it all got messed up. And the Bible, psh, we don't have any of the original manuscripts, and we don't. If you want, the want to go to see the original copy of the Declaration of Independence, the one that the Founding Fathers signed, you go down to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and you can actually look at the original copy of the Declaration of Independence. And we know it's there because Nicholas Gage brought it back, okay? Um, he turned it back in. Um, so if you're not la laughing, you need to see that movie. So anyway, uh, so it, we, we can put our hands on the original copy of the Constitution, the original copy of the Declaration of Independence. They have one of the original copies of the Magna Carta down in the National Archives, too. Um, but that is, we, don't, we can't go to any museum and, and find the original book of Genesis or the original book of Revelation. We've lost them. They're gone. So people are like, well, because of the telephone game, then how can I trust that what I'm reading here is actually what was written? And, and, and I find this funny because anyone that's actually studied ancient literature or ancient history knows the answer to this. The first thing is, we don't have, we only have seven copies, seven copies of the original writings of Plato. We don't have the original of Plato's Republic and all the other stuff that Plato wrote. We've only, we don't have any of the originals. We only have copies. Not that we only have seven copies, seven, seven copies the earliest of which date to like a thousand years after Plato wrote them. We only have like a, a dozen copies of Julius Caesar's account of the Gallic Wars. You know, you look at all these ancient writings that no historian really questions, 
And we've only got a handful of copies. I think the most I saw in one of these ancient uh, writings was like 50 copies of it or something. But if you look at the New Testament, just the New Testament, there are close to 6,000 Greek manuscript copies of the New Testament. So we have an, a plentiful uh, amount of copies of the New Testament, either in fragments or in full form of the New Testament. We also have the writings of the early church fathers. And you could reconstruct most of the New Testament because they quote from the New Testament just by looking at their letters. You've also got Latin manuscripts of the New Testament that date back to the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages. So we've got, an, it, all historians will concede there's an embarrassment of riches when it comes to New Testament documents. So this is a, is a non sequitur, it's a red herring, it is, it is a bogus objection. You can, you can choose to reject the Bible because you don't like it, but you can't choose to reject the Bible because you, da you doubt that it authentically has preserved itself. God has preserved his word. Um, I don't agree with the Bible on X issue. You know, whatever, insert the issue of the day. I don't agree with the Bible on that. Well, that's like saying, I don't agree with President Biden on some stuff, therefore President Biden does not exist. You know, it's like, does that mean that the President of the United States, whether it's Joe Biden or Donald Trump or whoever, that if the President of the United States ceases to exist every time I disagree with him? And then if I agree with him, he pops back into existence again. All right? And that's how some people treat Bible and Christianity. Well, I don't agree with it, therefore it must not be true, as if they are the standard of truth. Just because you disagree with the Bible on something has no bearing on the Bible's credibility. Just because you disagree with Jesus on something has no bearing on Jesus' credibility. You know, that it, it, it is a complete logical non sequitur for you to say, I don't agree with it, therefore it's irrelevant or it's not true. You've been hurt. There's a lot of people that have walked away from Christianity or walked away from the church because they've been hurt in church. So I want to say to you from the bottom of my heart, not that I can speak for all Christians, but as a pastor, I am sorry if you've been hurt. And I know that people have been hurt in church. Some people have been hurt deeply and terribly in church. And I understand that. And I wish that that weren't the case for you. But here's the promise. You'll probably get hurt again. Because churches are made up of people. And hurting people hurt people. And so you're always going to get hurt when you're around people. You get hurt, I'm sure, in your family sometimes. You've been hurt, I'm sure, by your friends sometimes. But I hope you understand how illogical it would be for you to walk away and reject all the possibility of any family relationship because you've been hurt in families before. Or to say, I'm never going to have a friend again because I had a friend that hurt me. It makes just as much logical sense for you to walk away from Christianity because you've been hurt by other Christians. Again, keep your focus on the Lord. Keep your focus on the Lord. Um, Christians disagree. This is a big one. And I've actually uh, debated some people on this one. It's like, you Christians can't even agree on stuff. you got all these denominations, and they're, and they're right. In fact, if you just look at the different Baptist denominations, let's just take the Baptists. We're messed up. The Baptists have tons of disagreements. Even if you stick within just the Southern Baptists, there's tons of disagreements in the Southern Baptist Church. And tons of disagreements amongst all the multiple Baptist denominations. And then, of course, you go out and you look at disagreements within the Presbyterians, within the Methodists. They're about to no longer be the United Methodist Church. And you look at disagreements in all the Episcopalians and the Catholics. You know, it's like, wow, I mean, you Christians can't even agree, so how can I trust you? Again, keep your focus on Christ. Because you know what? The disciples didn't always agree either. The disciples were often a mess, too. So keep your focus on Jesus. Keep your focus on him. And by the way, Christians, I'm talking Bible-believing Christians, agree on more than they disagree on. It's just we tend to focus on our disagreements. Um, or you're confused. I understand this, but the worst thing you could do if you're confused about something in the Bible or confused about something you heard is to walk away from the Bible and walk away from the faith. If you're confused, get close to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The closer you are to Jesus, the closer you are to the truth, the less confused you will be. God doesn't do things the way you would. 
A lot of people don't approve of the Bible or Christianity or because God just doesn't cooperate with them and do things the way that they want him to. Why did God take away my loved one? Why did God allow this tragedy to happen? Why did God allow that? And God often has a different timetable and different purposes than we do. But the fact that God may have opinions different from you or the fact that God may do things differently from you does not justify walking away from him. Years and years ago, way before I was a pastor, I remember a time when I was so mad at God and I felt the Lord say to me, you don't know me well enough to be mad at me. And he was right. And so I'd encourage you to trust in the Lord. Now Paul tells us why we should believe in the resurrection of the dead, why we should have hope in Christianity, and he tells us that in the first 11 verses of this wonderful chapter here. So if you look at 1 Corinthians 15 again, I'm just going to read these, these first few verses here with you. 1 Corinthians 15, and starting in verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. The gospel means good news, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand. I'd like you to consider, what do you stand on? What beliefs or worldview do you stand in? Paul is saying, we as Christians need to be standing in the gospel. By which also you are saved. Your salvation is based on the gospel. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Really quick on this one. There are many people that go to church but they don't really believe. And Paul would say those people believe in vain. They're going through the motions. They're checking off the boxes. They're like, yeah, but their heart's not really in it. Now, if your heart is not in it, if you've not given your heart to the Lord and saying, I trust you, I give my life to you, then you believe in vain. And this salvation is not a part of you right now. And I don't say that to be harsh. I said it out of love. You need to trust the Lord. You need to trust him. And not just with part of your life, not just with part of your heart, trust him with your whole heart. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. Most scholars in studying this believe that Paul here, for most of this passage I just read to you, starting in verse number 3 and going up to about uh, verse number uh, six, most scholars believe that he's quoting from an early church creed, that this is an oral tradition that was quoted by the early church, and even many non-Christian scholars date this creed back to the third century. Paul's writing this in the fifth, excuse me, not third century, third decade of the first century. Paul's writing this a letter in the fifth decade of the first century. The creed dates back to the third decade of the first century, that's the same decade in which Jesus was crucified and he rose again. Then Paul writes, For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was, within, was, was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. So this is the core of the gospel right now. This is the core message of Christianity that Paul is going over here. First of all, Paul is saying Christ died. He died for our sins. He rose from the dead. Now, you can get confused and, and tied around the knot on all these other doctrines, and I'm not saying they're unimportant. They are. These other beliefs and these disagreements. But right here, this is core Christianity. This is what C.S. Lewis would call mere Christianity. This is Christianity at the basics. We're sinners. Jesus died for our sins. He rose again. We put our faith and trust in Jesus. We are saved. That's Christianity right there in a nutshell. Core Christianity. 
Now, in order for this to be true, in order for this to be true, we got to, did Jesus die? Did, did he die? You know, did, did you, and, and of course, before you ask that, did he live? And there are many people, uh, you, you know, I don't want to, you got to live first before you can die, okay? So I know it's complicated, but uh, there are many people today who are called mythicists, and they believe Jesus was a myth. Comedian Bill Maher is in this group. And, and there are many, uh, uh, many uh, internet activists and social media influencers, article writers and stuff that say Jesus was a myth, that his story was based on other legends from other gods, from the Greek pantheon and Roman pantheon, and even the Egyptian god Osiris, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and now, in credentialed historical studies, when I'm, I'm talking about serious historians, people that have been trained in the study of history, that belief, that claim, is laughed out of the classroom. No, and I mean no serious historian, questions the reality that Jesus was at the very least a historical figure. I give you non-Christian, this is important, non-Christian scholar Bart Ehrman who said this, the reality is that whatever else you may think about Jesus, he certainly did exist. That is the consensus of mainstream history. That's not, this is not preacher talk. This is the consensus of mainstream history that there was a real historical figure named Jesus of Nazareth. Fact, okay? Now, did he die? Did he die? And was he crucified? Well, we go and we look at the fire of Rome. This fire took place in 64 AD. The great fire of Rome destroyed most of the city of Rome. And a guy named Tacitus, a senator and historian, wrote about this in the second century AD. And he talks about Nero and who Nero blamed for the fire. Read this. Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, for whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our pure creators, Pontius Pilatus. So this is a non-Christian, in fact, someone that's hostile to Christianity, Tacitus, the Roman senator and historian, who actually believes Christians are guilty of abominations, not a Christian, Tacitus, in the second century, he's writing a history of the Roman Empire up to that point. He has access to all the Roman records at that point. And Tacitus says, yeah, Christus, this is Latin for Christ, Christus, Christ was indeed crucified by Pontius Pilate. So, Yes, it's a historical fact that Jesus Christ was crucified. This is not the only evidence, by the way. I could keep going on this if I had time. There's plenty of extra-biblical evidence for Jesus, plenty of extra-biblical evidence for his crucifixion. No serious historian questions that he lived. No serious historian questions that he died. So did Jesus die for our sins? Well, if you want to understand someone's motive, it's best to ask that person. And Jesus certainly said that he did. You go to John chapter 3 in his conversation with Nicodemus. He says that unless the Son of Man be lifted up, like Moses lifted up the serpent, we have no hope. And in that same conversation, this is, chapter, this is verse 16, the most memorized verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's Jesus, his own words. Um, Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Luke, we look at this as the account of the Lord's Supper in Luke. We just observed that on Friday. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. So yes, that's why we do the Lord's Supper. We do the Lord's Supper because Jesus made it clear he died for our sins. And every time we as a church observe the Lord's Supper, we remember his sacrifice for our sins. So yes, Jesus told us that he came and died for our sins. Your sins were nailed to the cross. Now, did Jesus rise from the dead? That is really the linchpin. And um, for time's sake, I can't go through all the evidence on this, but let me just trust me when I say that there are so many books written on this, they are doorstoppers. Books written by scholars that list out all the evidence, historical evidence for the, cruci for the crucifixion and resurrection. These books top out at over a thousand pages. 
One, two of the most famous ones is The Resurrection of the Son of God by N.T. Wright and one that just came out by Gary Habermas, one of, the leading, and one of the leading scholars in the resurrection. He just wrote one. I bought it as soon as it came off the press. It's over a 1,000 pages, so I'm going to read that this summer uh, when I have a little bit of time. Uh, and it is, it, is, it is a monstrous book, but the evidence for the resurrection is plentiful. Uh, you have everything from the fact that the tomb was discovered empty and still empty today. Uh, you have the fact that no one has ever been able to produce the body of Jesus. And, if, and, and, and they certainly would have. That would have been a great way to, to disprove it right then at the very beginning. You've got the fact that many people who did not believe in Jesus all of a sudden, in a matter of days after his crucifixion, started proclaiming that he rose from the dead, including James. And within three years, Paul. Paul persecuted Christians, and something all of a sudden changed him, and he becomes the leading apostle for Christianity. Uh, you've got the fact that Jewish adherents to the Christian faith who believed Jesus was the Messiah changed the worship day from Saturday to Sunday. Why would they do that? You know, I mean, I could keep going on and on and on. You've got the post-resurrection appearances that Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians 15. Hundreds of people claim to see Jesus alive after his crucifixion. Even non-Christian historians concede that there is evidence for the resurrection, even if they don't believe it. And the reason why people don't believe in the resurrection today really comes down to two things. Either they don't want to, or they don't believe in miracles. And so this is where the rubber meets the road. This is what I want to put to you right now. Do you believe in miracles? Do you believe in God? Because if God is real, then miracles can happen. It is as simple as that. And you're like, well, that's great, but how do I know God is real? If I said to you that this table up here that my Bible is resting on poofed into existence 14 years ago when I became the pastor, you would, at that point, ask my wife if I'm taking my medication. If I said to you that, uh, that this building that was built in the 1980s, that wing was built in the 1990s, wasn't really built by human hands. It just magically appeared one day. People came to church and, boop, it was here. If I said any of that to you, you would consider that an insane comment. And rightly so. Because anything that begins to exist must have a cause. That is common sense. And yet the scientific community tells us, the majority of them will concede, that the universe that we inhabit right now has not always been here, that it began to exist. And therefore, this universe that we're a part of since it began to exist, it requires a cause. Not just any cause. I can't say that this chair caused the universe, because this chair is not capable of causing the universe. When I say something caused the universe into existence, that means it had to be capable of bringing into existence space, time, matter, and energy. Well, let's see. What would be a sufficient cause for space, time, matter, and energy? I know, something that's spaceless, timeless, eternal, all-powerful. Hmm, who does that sound like? So the evidence for God is overwhelming. This is why Paul says in Romans 1 that we have all this evidence around us and we are without excuse. This is why the psalmist writes, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. You know, it is only those who, are, who, are, who refuse to believe the obvious, those who refuse to believe um, the, the, the evidence that reject God's existence. And so here's the deal. And I've just given you one of about 20 arguments for the existence of God. There's about 20 of them. And, and it, it is so clear and it's so overwhelming. But the real issue is, what do you believe? And do you have faith? Do you have faith that God is real and that he loves you? What we celebrate today on Easter Sunday is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate the fact that Jesus came, he died for your sins, he died for my sins, and he rose again. And that proves 
that we can have comfort in our Lord Jesus Christ. It proves what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. I want to close by reading the end of this chapter here to you because it's a wonderful, wonderful promise here that gives assurance, especially those of us that have lost loved ones, just like the people in Corinth did that first century. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, our bodies, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the resurrection. We thank you, Father, for the fact that we can trust in you. That because you raised your son from the dead, we can look forward to eternal life with you. Father, I pray if there's anyone here that has any questions about any of this, that they will seek me out. One of our elders will be happy to talk with them. I pray, Father, that, that you will not let anyone walk out of here discouraged, but let us all be encouraged and inspired by the fact that you are real. We exist because of you, and we are loved by you. May we trust in your love. May we give our hearts totally to you. May we be steadfast and unmovable in our faith because of the fact that you have indeed conquered death through your son, Jesus Christ. We ask all this in your son's holy and very precious name. Amen.